Psalms. I've chosen the book of Psalms because it's a book like no other. It is true, those of you who are Bible students, that all scriptures are important, all scriptures are beneficial and inspired by the Holy Spirit. However, when you come to the book of Psalms, this book occupies a special and unique place in the Holy Scriptures because, as I've said, it is a book like no other. The book of Psalms has 150 chapters altogether, making it the most voluminous and biggest of all books of the Bible. It would be not good for me to get into the message of today until I have given you an overview of what book we are dealing with. And this is the great book of Psalms. The book of Psalms lies at the very center and the heart of the entire Bible. It is a book which is believed to have been authored the longest in terms of writing and composition. From the first psalm to the last psalm, we have a span of over 1,000 years. We have psalms that were written during the times of Moses, psalms that were written during the times of David, during the monarch, and psalms that were written during the times of the of the children of Israel in Babylon and those Psalms that were written after the exile, a span of over 1,000 years. The book of Psalms also falls in the category of scriptures that are referred to as the wisdom Psalms. And when we talk of wisdom Psalm as a type of literature, we're not talking about Gospels, we're not talking about epistles, we're not talking about uh, historical scriptures. The Bible has a number of classification of scriptures, but you come to the wisdom scriptures, these are Psalms or scriptures that were not authored from the throne room of God in heaven, but one that were authored from the heart of man rising over to God at his throne. And in the book of Psalms, as all in the other wisdom scriptures, you will not find, thus says the Lord. Because in the book of Psalms, man is talking directly to his God. And it's seen here that you find man pouring himself so fervently, yearning over to God and seeking for the face of God. In the book of Psalms, you come to, an, a, a, to a type of scriptures that were authored by the wise men out of experience and observation through their life experiences of faith. And this is the book that we're dealing with. A book that speaks to us because it is this time man speaking to God, man talking to himself about the challenges of relating with his God. And so we are today and the subsequent times that shall come dealing and focusing on Psalm 127, which happens to have three or four inexhaustible gems that I want to share with you as we go by. Psalm 127 speaks about three cardinal elements in the life of a human being. Cardinal elements that define a man's success and failure. Cardinal elements that define a man's achievement in life or their failure in life. And these three cardinal elements are the ones that I want to share with you subsequently so that we can be able to gauge ourselves as to how to make a point and a mark in life as we carry on. For what is life if we go through it meaninglessly and without focus to an extent that we can reach the end of life asking ourselves as if we ever lived? So 127 speaks about those three cardinal gems. And what are they? The first cardinal element that Psalm 127 talks about is the vertical relationship, that is man's relationship to his God. And it will say in vain, if God doesn't build with you, if God doesn't do it with you, and that's the vertical relationship, man's relationship to God. But you come over to verse 3 onwards, you'll be able to discover that an important element is there discussed, and that is the element of marriage and the family. And that's the horizontal relationship. 
whereby man not only lives to relate to God, but lives to relate to one another. And the basic unit where our relationship is demonstrated is the element of the family. And that is verse 3 to, to 5. You come over to verse 2, you come to another element when it says, In vain do you rise up early going for work, yet it is the Lord who gives sleep. And that's the other third element, which is our work and employment. For the subsequent times that shall come, I want to talk to you from putting your life in the right perspective by looking at the three important elements that define your success, that define your failure, that define your achievement in life. Now, Psalm 127 happens to be what is called a pilgrim psalm. Other versions call it an ascent psalm or a psalm of degrees. And this we a special category of Psalms that are recorded from 120 to 134. And they are believed to have been Psalms written and composed and sung by the children of Israel, by those pilgrims when they were trekking the journey from their homes going to Jerusalem during the three major annual festivals to worship the Lord and interact with one another. Festivals that required every Israelite male to go and celebrate them in Jerusalem and no other place. And what were the three major festivals? That we have the first one as the festival of the Passover that begins from Egypt. And then we have the festival of Pentecost that happens 50 days exactly after Passover. And then we have the festival of shelters. Which festival was a festival of thanksgiving after the harvest? And these are the three uh, major festivals that uh, have a bearing upon Psalms 120 to 134, which are called the Pilgrim Psalms. However, we've gone and picked one of them from within the middle and picked one of them, and this is 127. One that I want us to meditate upon during this time. Now, when you look at this psalm, the proscription tells us that it was authored or written by Solomon. It's ascribed to Solomon as the writer. And if it is Solomon who is the writer, you will be able to identify with one key word that sets off this psalm. And the psalm is vanity. This psalm which is vanity, you will be able to notice, my brother and sister listening to me, that the psalm, the word vanity is one that, 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 that sets off this word, this, this psalm, but it's also the very word that sums up the book of Ecclesiastes, which book is believed to have also been written by Solomon. It begins by saying, unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in what? In vain. It says, unless the Lord builds the city, the watchman wakes up and watches over in what? In vain. And then he says, in vain. He repeats this word three times uh, to, to also bring us the understanding that it has a direct bearing upon the book of Ecclesiastes, which is believed to have been written by Solomon, as I've told you. Now, vanity is the signature term of the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter 1 verses 2 and 3 tells us that vanity of vanities, says the preacher, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. And verse 3 says, what profit has a man from all his labor which he toils under the sun? Vanity of vanities. The word vanity is very characteristic and very important for us to understand this text because it is how to ask us a question about life's meaninglessness, I mean, the meaning of life and the purpose of our existence. This enigmatic Hebrew term, Hebel, uh, which the note is, is a word which is translated for vanity. Vanity, the Hebrew word is Hebel. And Hebel denotes something which is transitory, something which fleets by, something which denotes a state of emptiness or something that is nothing 
something that is worthless, useless, or profitless. All these semantic ranges of the word can be able to point us to the understanding of this word vanity. That's the reason as to why when you go over to various Bible versions, this word vanity is translated variously as meaninglessness, profitless, as useless, and so on and so on. And the word vanity is very important for us to understand this passage that we are dealing with of Psalm 127. Vanity is something like vapor, which you puff out and it goes. You can see vapor, but you can't touch it, and you don't know even where it goes. Vanity literally means, Heber literally means breath. Breath. And when you have spoken something, or breath has come out, what is the meaning thereafter? Hebel, therefore, has been likened to a mirage. A mirage is an optical illusion that causes something to appear real or possible, but it's not. And uh, if the writer of this psalm is Solomon, it also is very important for you to understand who is writing and why he writes it. Solomon was a king of Israel. One who ruled Israel for about 40 years. He was one of the wealthiest men ever lived. One who is reckoned to have been the wisest of men that have ever lived. A prolific writer, author, and musician. One who had power. One who had status. One who had fame and glamour. He was a very experienced man in terms of love and relationships. To an extent that the Bible records that this man, so-called Solomon, was able in, during his lifetime to gather around himself 300 concubines and a whooping number of 700 wives to his credit. A total of 1,000 wives for himself alone. Such is the man who is the writer of the psalm that we're dealing with, 127. A man of vast experience in many things. But when Solomon is setting out his road of exploration in understanding what life presents and the meaning and purpose of life, Solomon experimented with all things a person can think of under the sun. And he goes on his experiences, but in all these experiments, in all these pursuits that Solomon goes for, in all his research findings, he concludes with one word, which is vanity. Vanity of vanities. All is vanity under the sun. Brothers and sisters, listen to me. You and I were created by God. We are not people that, we're not creatures that evolved and mutated from small creatures to what we are. The Bible bears testimony that we were created in the image and likeness of God. Some, I mean, Genesis chapter 1 verse 27 says, So God created man in his image, in the, like, in the image of God, he created him male and female, he created them. Bible bears testimony, Father. That you and I were not only created in the image and likeness of God, but you and I have the breath of God. For Genesis 2, 27 says, And the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. You and I are human beings today because we have the breath of God. And this breath of God makes us who we are as individuals, as persons, as living entities. So we are a product of God's own imagination, God's own thinking, and God's own making. And in creation, God entrusted the blessings of this world to you and me. For you read Genesis 1, 28, and the Bible will be able to tell you that he blessed them and told them, go and replenish and fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over it. Go and, and, and rule over the fish of the, of the seas, the birds of the air, and everything that creeps on the land. And that text tells you that God not only created us in his image, his likeness, but he also sent us forth with his breath as human beings to enjoy and 
benefit from this world. So because of that, we are procreators. We are inventors of our own sorts. We are designers to an extent that we can bring things into existence. We can create empires. We can build buildings. We can, we can be able to create entities. We can discover and bring things into existence to an extent that you and me are procreators who can be able to be defined, in other words, as small goals. We are some small goals of some kind. We can bring things into existence. And, verse, and, and the, the chapter, the chapter of uh, Psalm 100 and, I mean 127 is out to tell us that there are many things we can do. We can build houses. We can go labor. We can take care of ourselves. We can watch over things. We can produce children. We can be able to make money. We can be able to study and get degrees. We can do so, so much more. However, the Bible is telling us in here that though we can be able to do many things, it says, unless the Lord builds the house, you can build it. You can build it, but you build in vain. Unless the Lord guards the city, you guard it in vain. What is the Bible here trying to say? The Bible is here trying to bring out one important element, that in our natural way of creation, God has potentially endowed a human being that they can do so much more to turn their lives around with him or without him. As a human being, you can be able to produce children whether you know God or not. You can be able to go and study and get knowledge and get degrees whether you believe in God or not. You can be able to go and court a woman and, and convince her, bring her home. You can be able to produce children and, and, and bring them and raise them up. You can be able to make money and have a fat back out account. You can do so much more. But the Bible is bringing a message home that though you can do all which you can do, unless the Lord builds or does it with you, you do it, yes, you do it, but you do it in vain. Many of us have attempted it. We have worked many years without God, but when we look back at what we have done, we can count nothing. Many of us have produced children without God. But when you look at your children, they're more of a snare and a nightmare to you that torment you every day than a blessing. Many of us have gone over to make money, but though we have much income coming in, we, count, we can count nothing. Many of us have gone from job to job, but not getting anything. Many of us have gone into gardens planting, Season after season, but we have harvested nothing. That's why the Bible is saying, as human beings, we can do much. We can bring things into existence, but unless the Lord does it with us, we can do it, but do it in vain. Friends, anything we do without God is what Solomon is defining as vanity. John 15, the gospel according to John verse, chapter 15 verse 5 says, I am the vine. This is Jesus Christ. I am the vine. You are the branches. He who abides in me, I and I in him bear much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. Brothers and sisters, Christ is here making a statement. We are connected to God. We have God's breath in us. We have God's DNA upon us. We have his image and likeness on us. And that tells you that we belong to God. And if we belong to God and we are but branches, we cannot exist on our own. You know, one person has said something that we have a vacuum in all of us. A vacuum which only God can fill to bring meaningful, meaningfulness in life. Until you put God in his right place. Brother and sister, listening to me. Until you bring the puzzle 
and you put God in his right place, there is something going to be fundamentally wrong with you for the rest of your life. Unfortunately, you are going to learn it very late when all almost is said and done. So the Bible is saying, unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. Brothers and sisters, listening to me. Psalm 127 is asking a very important question. What is it that you want to do in life? Is it education? Is it career? Is it politics? Is it marriage? Is it love relationship? What is it? Is it a business? What is it that you want to do? The Psalm 127 is saying, do, do it, but do it with God and for God's glory. Brothers and sisters, listen to me. Bible is saying, come, let us do it together. And that's why Matthew 6, 33 will be able to give us counsel. And Jesus told the, the, those listening and watching to him, he said, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all other things will be added unto you. Fra fr friends, listen to me. If we want to be successful in this world, if we want to, to, to count real achievement and satisfaction and contentment in life, seek ye the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all other things will be added unto you. This is the message that the, 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 the writer of Psalm 127 is bringing across. A pastor of a well-to-do congregation gave an arousing sermon on how to view our possessions on a Sabbath day such as now. His sermon was, nothing we have is ours. And he says, all is transitory, all is fleeting, all is worthless. The, sermon, the pastor was preaching this sermon to a relatively wealthy congregation. But when he was preaching, one wealthy member of the congregation, a lawyer, for it, took offense at what the pastor had to say. And he was not happy with what the pastor said. You know, sometimes you preach a sermon and you see people looking at you, but when they're not amused. And so this lawyer took offense at what the pastor was saying. All is not ours. All is fleeting. All is worthless. And so what he did at the end of the sermon, the lawyer invited the pastor to his vast estate. And he took him around on, on a tour of his suburban home and its beautifully landscaped yard, the pool area, the gardens, and every good thing you can ever think of a person can be able to amass and do in this world, like the wealthy ones we have in Uganda today. As the lawyer took the minister through the parade of his servants over to the parade banquet table, the lawyer pointedly asked the pastor, Pastor, did you mean what you said in your sermon the other day? Pastor, did you mean to say, the lawyer said, that with a wave of his hand, did you mean to say that all this that you have seen is not mine? Pastor, did you mean to say that all this is worthless that we have gone through? Uh, bear in mind, he had taken him around. And now he's bringing him to the table to eat. And he's asking him the question. Do you mean that's worthless? Pastor, are you talking out of poverty or out of a grudge for those of us who are poor? Do you mean this car is useless? Do you mean this mansion is useless? Do you mean that this all is useless? The pastor swallowed some saliva asked God's intervention, and simply smiled and replied to him, why don't you ask me that question 50 years from now? Why don't you ask me, Mr. Lawyer, that question 50 years from now? Brothers and sisters, listen to me. Come with me 50 years from now. What will you be able to count from what you have? If you can't count anything 50 years from now, where will you be 50 years from now? 
What you consider important, will it be important then? I want to finish by asking you to put God in his right place for you to have a meaningful life in this life that you live. May God bless you and may God guide you that as you pursue life, you will not build, you will not marry, you will not do anything on planet earth until you accept God to work with you and to consult with God. This is my prayer for you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us pray together. Heavenly Father, it's been a special moment as we've gotten into your word, especially in Psalm 127. Help us that we will never go ahead of you, nor do things by our own, though you have created us with the ability to do them. But may we never do anything until we have done it with you. May we seek your kingdom first before any other thing, so that you will add all other things upon us. For this is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. And thank you. Give me the Bible, holy message shining. Thy light shall guide me in the narrow way. Precept and promise, my love. NTV, turning on your world. Kampala Advocacy Project for Improved Wash Resource Allocation and Reduced Water Tariff runs in the divisions of Kawempe, Nakawa and Rubaga. The project seeks to strengthen duty-bearer engagement in promoting consultative practices in decision-making towards provision of quality and affordable water, sanitation and health services, especially to the poor and marginalized communities in Kampala. The project aspires to reinforce platforms that promote duty-bearers and citizens' engagement in the processes of planning, budgeting, monitoring and responsive decision making on service delivery, respective policy, legal framework relating to water, sanitation and health. Join us this Saturday at 5 p.m. for a live discussion as we tackle the theme Is Budgeting and Planning for Kampala City Supportive of Pro Poor Centered Service Delivery a case for water, hygiene and sanitation? Panelists include Arias Lukwago, Lord Mayor Kampala City, Helen Kasuja, Deputy Executive Director, Sidi, Ronald Chitakufe, Manager, Urban Propo Branch, National Water and Storage Corporation, moderated by Charles Mwangusha, organized by Community Integrated Development Initiatives, Sidi, and supported by Danish People's Aid, DPA, and the Democratic Governance Facility, DGF. dream of a roof on our head, but not just a roof. Good sheltering is what we desire. The Property Show is part of your dreams as we inspire you with new architectural designs, affordable housing, and what the world of luxury inspires. Every week, discover the latest trends in construction, interior designing, and landscaping. Plus, get some hot land deals and hot property deals. I think to answer that really, it's, it's a combination of many things. I think one, remember we only about two or three months out of lockdown, um, the pandemic. Hello and welcome to this week's edition of the Property Show. Edwin Mosime is my name and I'll be joined by Christabel later on, who will be bringing us the property of the week that is brought by Decoflow. Now Nile Ply is one of our partners and now they have the latest innovation on the market for the Decoflow. What is the Decoflow all about? You ensure that you actually have a flow that has a wooden feel. It doesn't matter whether you already have tiles there or not.